back for a full talk after an amazing dog based lightning talk last year. Um, you've worked on too many things for me to list. So I'm just going to let you take the floor and talk about what you what you want, because I'm buckling down mentally for this presentation. <laughs> I appreciate it. And thank you for that lovely introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Oliver Nelson Jr. I do and have done just so many things. I've worked on over 60 games in the past five years, uh, some of which you may know, including Skatebird, an airport for aliens currently run by dogs, uh, Frog Fractions 3, Reigns Beyond, Hypnospace Outlaw, Space Warlord Organ Training Simulator, and more. Uh, I was a journalist once upon a time. I've worked in tabletop and literature. I write comics. <laughs> and once upon a time, I also gallivanted around the world giving talks, strange interactive experiences, in general, coming upon my current passion and eternal pursuit, which is finding ways to make games better, faster, cheaper, and more healthy for the people who create them so that we can allow the people who make the interactive experiences that we love to have long-lasting and evolving creative careers. Their best work in 15 years as opposed to five this talk is titled Building an Economic Flesh Simulation Will Make You Disassociate from Reality because it's true. I've lived it. It's a nightmare. And uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to fully grasp or believe in anything anymore. Uh, let me explain for just a second. I'm making, as I mentioned uh, earlier, among the many, many games I work on, Space Warlord Organ Trading Simulator. It comes out this winter. Uh, within the next few months, it is about buying, selling, and trading the one thing that everyone has and everyone needs in a strange and evolving universe, organs. And depending on who you serve and how you serve them, uh, the decisions you make with your clients may impact the universe permanently. And all of this began as a spur-of-the-moment joke with a friend like over a year ago. So... Late 2019, I'm talking with a friend. We're discussing how the simulator genre has single-handedly occupied an unbreakable niche in Steam that's growing and growing. And games that even have somewhat absurd or simple simulations are selling thousands and thousands of copies. My friend asks me, what simulator game would you make to put onto Steam? And... Uh, Without a single moment of hesitation, deep from the eldritch recesses of my brain, I say, Space Warlord Organ Trading and Regulation Simulator. After the laugh and the joke uh, and a moment of consideration, I then realize I have invented the perfect video game. Here's why. Organs. They're easily systematized, right? You know what an organ is. There's a given number of organs with known traits and uh, modifiers you can add to them, blood type, rarity, size, etc. They're unique and compelling. No one's out there saying, let's give the soft, juicy, liquid flesh a real moment in the sun. Uh, even hospital tycoons are scared of engaging with the meat at the heart of humanity. It's also just vaguely erotic. You see those intestines sliding around and you go like, I don't know what you're saying, but you're saying something. In other words, a game centered around organs and economics is a surefire hit and something that you can, with thought, consideration, hopefully, maybe, apply pretty reasonable, accessible, easy to release procedural generation and systemic elements to. Create a lot from a little and make that lot, each little bit of it, really matter uh that was the, the you know the thesis and then as time passed on and i reached a point where we actually started to develop this game uh we suddenly had to answer some questions which i wasn't prepared for the first one being very simple seemingly what are the organs I was like, I know this one. Uh, there's a heart. There's a org. There's like livers, lungs, gallbladders, uh, bladders, um, pan pancreases, brains. 
nerves ner nerves are important in the body and they're inside you but i don't i'm not sure if they're i'm not sure if they're they're an organ i'll have to look that up Te teeth are teeth an organ ear ear eardrums do eardrums count what followed was a breathless 48 hours in which i slowly but surely lost my mind as i considered the gradations of what not just medical science considers an organ and what these organs actually do but what we would define and decide as an organ what was in fact an arbitrary decision on our part that meant everything and as much as it's based upon our flawed limited perspective would be seen as an objective projection of truth into the reality of our game uh skin is an organ and the question comes up should we sell skin is that okay in the interest of nuanced satire, there is a potential to even replace the blood type system for skin specifically with light skin to dark skin and value one higher than the other. Either way you put it, it is incredibly fucked up and an unfortunate uh, glimpse into uh, the real horrific realities of our uh, cultural biases and uh, economic systems. But you know, unlike the real life horrors that we have to live through, this is more likely to get censored by the ESRB and have people shouting at you on Twitter. We have to look at the factors that impact an organ's value. Some people genetically have organs that are smaller than others. If we decide the value of an organ uh, as being partially determined by its size, we're suddenly making decisions about health. Uh, which as a group of game designers and developers and, and artists and just people, we, we aren't qualified to be saying a gigantic heart is inherently better than a small heart. And also we slowly but surely start to step into the realm of eugenics, the video game. I thought we were grappling with all this fine. We were winnowing down the list. We had like 20 or so organs. And we were like, okay, we aren't going to determine stuff by size. We aren't going to get uh, weird or racist with this. We hope we figured this out. And someone in the chat asked, is the soul an organ? It was our programmer, Sam Chet, and I want to name him because he was the person who did the first crack in the glass that represented my sanity. Because suddenly, again, from a single seemingly simple or arbitrary systemic decision, there's a spiraling series of implications. If the soul is an organ, what role does it have in an afterlife? Who possesses a soul? What does it mean to have possess a different quality of soul? Where are these harvested from? Uh, we are in an alien universe, so do aliens have souls? Do they have the same souls that humans boo? This tangled web of nightmares that I had found myself stepping into, mixing both economics as well as the body. As I took even just a slightly step, a uh, slight step back, I understood how much this was just emblematic of the range of decisions that a game developer makes across a project's development cycle. And I knew this ahead of time. I believe this. I understood this. But having to grapple with it viscerally when dealing with viscera, I felt deeply unprepared to deal with the full consequences of my actions. And a game and a concept that seemed fun and that mirrored you know, my own fascination with Things like satire and body horror and finding nuanced ways, of, nuanced, ab absurd ways to express nuanced worldviews, opinions, and glimpses into a wider universe. Um, this all seemed to fit that objective, but as soon as I started to make decisions and value judgments upon this universe, my idea of objectivity and of easy systemization, not of vague erotica, uh, vague organ erotica is still valid, but everything else started to crumble. We have this concept in games that we call finding the fun. And it 
essentially refers to designing and or discovering the compelling and ideally unique portions of your experience. It is determined uh, and discussed as one of the most important pieces of your development cycle, if not the most important. People say that a gr groundbreaking moment on their project is whenever they found the fun or realizing that they had lost it and how much development time and human anguish would result from that mistaken assumption that they had found it in the first place. That's valid. It's interesting. But in our pursuit of finding the fun and prioritizing this ideal, if we just continue to follow that chain, we aren't finding the fun anymore. We're following the fun and assuming the responsibility for a chain of beliefs and implications rather than deciding upon them. This is part of an entirely larger discussion, which I'm happy to have at some point with anyone who's interested, but this is part of why I do kind of believe in suboptimal game design decisions, because yes, the objective quote unquote, most fun decision at any given moment might be X, but if it does not end up creating something that matches the reality of your world or something that you even want to bring into existence. Maybe not something that you personally believe in or could justify. I believe making a suboptimal game design decision is not just valid, but important. I thought of economics so, uh, and the nature of what it means to be human and what we're composed of. Things that philosophers and very, very smart people have debated for centuries, uh, if not millennia. I thought that these were things that were set in stone. But so often, the so-called objective systems and categorizations are just reflections of a flawed, limited human perspective that is itself changing over time. And the ways in which it is changing might not be in the interest of the human beings who it represents. We had grappled with this. We looked in the face of horror. We decided that aliens do in fact have souls. And also that souls are inherently human. The nightmare of being like, okay, all human organs in the market are affected and then, be, and then having to just disassociate into space for an hour as you go like do do organs that are souls belong on that list i don't know we thought we had gotten past that hump and had continued on with development and then gamestop happened if you aren't familiar with what the whole thing about gamestop is last year people decided to uh boost the value uh, of GameStop's sales to the point that it nearly destabilized the international economic system. Uh, essentially, the more people invested into GameStop, the more investors who would bet against the stock would be forced to cover the difference in terms of their shorting of the stock as a term um, not coming true. And this is an escalating cycle, which is easily manipulable. Uh, when I was a kid, I asked my dad to invest in GameStop because I was like, GameStop is great. We go there all the time. It's so cool. I'm 11. I know about financial uh, systems. Turns out the current stock value of GameStop is $183 still. Nearly a year post boom. When I was a kid and as early as last year late 20 late uh, 2020 early 2019 it was 12 bucks it's over a thousand percent difference just decided by arbitrary belief and movement manipulating the inherent systems which we considered to be set in stone this fucking guy did one tweet a shit post on twitter and it made the stock of tesla dive more than 10 percent if one person can do one tweet that makes 
millions in theoretical value disappear, it is concrete proof that a so-called objective financial system, which operates based off of the great whims of the market, is actually founded upon mutual human faith. We ran into a bug where we had in our simulation of the market the idea that stocks would be partially based upon the movements of a wider world. If the market as a whole goes down, we assumed, all the stocks should also mirror in some way this change alongside their own internal simulation factors. What happened was that most of our stock tickers over time started to follow a similar flow, which not just inhibited interesting gameplay, but internal and external QA feedback uh, regarded as being not true to life. It was actually when we embraced true randomness and pattern finding the madness of the market that people believed it to be true. The more we tried to make the stock market make sense, we tried to clamp it and put it within a set structure. Actually, the less it worked. And at this point, we collectively lost our minds. The range of decisions in a game, anything as associated with assigning value became an overwhelming tidal wave of nightmarish implication scenarios. It, we have these philanthropic uh, hospital administrators made out of ice cream in the game. Long story. They're called administrators. Doing a quest for them, we have one of three sounds that can play when you fulfill a quest. One that's positive, one that's neutral, one that is negative. Our neutral one sounds a bit like an error message. So by default, most of our sounds for fulfilling a client requests in the game are positive. You are a cutthroat piece of shit in this video game. Excuse my French. Uh, if only because you participate by virtue of endorsing and working within this market, uh, widespread exploitation. And in this moment, because you're dealing with like philanthropic entities, even that decision, what freaking sound plays when you fulfill a request was like, okay, if it's positive, then you're both endorsing a, a, a view and perspective. Uh, also, it's in the standard uh, of the rest of the game's quest by default. But if you make it negative, it speaks to perhaps the perspective of your given player character, as well as something else that the world might be saying about assisting anything other than purely misanthropic aims. A tidal wave. And that was what shook me, because I'm used to doing a lot of writing. I've done a lot of game design in my time. Uh, and I'm used to authored and procedural experiences in a way that <laughs> made me feel I was prepared to make this game. But grappling with the idea that even beyond the writing, just the generation systems, the statistics, the base numbers that build up this reality, said more about our fi fictional world than the writing and marketing ever might, the things that the people actually experience would be little integers that would mean more than any of my words uh, did. That would, that terrified me. It shook me. Uh, and it left me grappling with the full implications of my decisions yet again. Get ready to be perceived. It's not in good faith to look into the systems and generations and bugs of any given game to call out a developer for how their worldview is incorrect uh, or prejudiced. It can be in bad faith, especially when those designers and developers might not have much agency in what those systems are. But also, <laughs> any and all of your systems can be a reflection of something concrete. And I might be preaching to the choir, but 
looking at every decision that you've made in your game, every category, every set of numbers and values, and drawing out the social, moral, uh, cultural, and uh, physical implications of those decisions one by one and whether you can stand by them. Uh, it very quickly emerged to the team, not just as a opportunity to say intentional things, even if making those decisions was itself scary, it became apparent as a necessity. Game design decisions can be and are advertising. Uh, Simon Parkin did an investigation for Eurogamer into how arms manufacturers collaborating with game studios are implicitly and explicitly advertising weapons. The Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifle is basically the most powerful sniper rifle in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. When I think of the sniper rifle, I played a lot of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 as a teenager. I think of the Barrett 50 caliber. And the company speaks to the concrete impact that has had on their, their sales because teenagers and kids become adults who buy guns and view guns within a framework of power and safety that is constructed by the digital worlds in which they experience them. I'm not saying that this is single-handed. I'm saying it contributes to a wider perception. There is an infamous article about uh, how RimWorld, uh, back in 2016, it was on our Rock, Paper, Shotgun, about how RimWorld modeled attraction and the differences between men and women in its game. However you feel about the article, the, the fact that there was any differentiation at all between male-coded and female-coded NPCs makes those differences meaningful and allows us to assign patterns to them that again, whether or not we believe them, are simply commentaries and part of the cloud of data points through which we see the world, through which we see value and logic. I love the Elder Scrolls Oblivion, it might be my favorite Elder Scrolls. In Elder Scrolls uh, Oblivion, Imperials have are kind of like the uh, sort of like standard slash, you know, noble race. Uh, they have racial traits associated with that, such as tradecraft, persuasion, um, and also based off their in-game appearance, lighter skin. Red guards, people who look like me, feel less pain and are more powerful in combat. I'm someone who, when I'm playing an RPG experience, whether it's in tabletop form or digital form, I love talking to people. I love lockpicking things. I love finding my ways into other parts of the world and making decisions that and impacts on the world without pulling out my sword at all. And if I want to pursue my chosen play style, I have to choose someone who doesn't look like me. There's coincidentally also a uh, negative five starting disposition towards red guards, which could be satire. It could be a fucked up racial bias. It could be a bug or just an arbitrary decision someone made somewhere. But in this cloud of data points, we have beliefs that are reinforced about the world. Uh, there are statements being made People are going to play Space World Organ Training Simulator and are going to have beliefs about what is and isn't an organ based off of the organs we put into the game. I know that that's coming. Yes, is it silly? Is it absurd? Am I not medically qualified? Sure. <laughs> But the fact that someone's going to be like, well, you know, the teeth, tooth is an organ and someone from somewhere in their brain, having played a lot of Space World Organ Training Simulator, which is doling out and giving you an experiential uh, moment with a variety of, of human and alien viscera. The fact that they might in that moment, because they played our game, have any hesitation at all about what is and isn't an organ 
is something that has kept me awake at night because this is a real statement being made about both our fictional and, and literal world. Um, I aged out of my healthcare a few years ago. I was a military brat. I aged out. That shook me. And I was in the middle of making an airport for aliens currently run by dogs. So one of the first NPCs I made, your save point in the game are these little medical clinics. He says, I'm a doctor, not a monster, as the punchline in a series of uh, in a series of conversations that you have with him. If you say, hey, what do I owe you for helping me? When I created a world that was inherently joyful and cared about you, a utopia, the reflection of it based upon my perspective and my fears was healthcare. Treatment that was free and that it would be absurd to believe otherwise. The numbers, categorizations, and arbitrary decisions we make are constantly making an impact on our audience. And again, I can't overstate how much that goes beyond the writing, that goes beyond the, even the context. We still, in games with lasers and rocket launchers, see the double barrel shotgun as a deserved place having a deserved place in the pantheon of the most powerful weapons in that game, regardless of genre, because of Doom, a game that came out more than 20 years ago, and its experiential impact on our medium to depart from that standard is to itself make a decision and a statement. And so the chain of decisions and the things that we say to and about each other and about the way in which we interpret reality goes on and on and on and on. I'm not saying that games have an especial responsibility to convey their worlds respectfully or to <laughs> hyperfixate on all of their decisions to the point of paralysis. It's not fair to our players and it's not fair to the people who make the games that we love. I'm simply saying that they're not exempt from conveying a perspective through their creative process and through the final product. I encourage you to seek the opportunities that your intentional development choices and implied perspective provide to find the fun and decide what fun is as opposed to following it. And assimilate some damn organs. Uh, my name is Vince Oliver Nelson Jr. Thank you so much for hearing me um, lose my mind and have an existential crisis for ha a half hour straight. And I wish you good luck because if you do this well, you might not just end up making a system, a set of systems and choices and categories that you believe in. You might end up creating something so effective that it causes your players to seek for or, and demand those systems for a better world in their own reality, our own reality. Well, thank you. Thank well, you. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, that was that was quite the thirty minutes. Thank you, Salvier. I think yeah, and there was a really um, troubled and then thoughtful discussion in chat. I think of of the mix of how it can be very disheartening, but also there's the push of you know. We can make intentional choices and we can do better. I think I like that note you ended on of this is an opportunity to do more than just make something fun. And if you lose your mind, it's an opportunity to find it again, you know? And give a talk. Like, <laughs> if there's anything I've learned from the modern economy in our real world, it's that I can commodify my pain. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Which actually, I mean, I, I hate that's the worst sentence to say, uh, speaking of. <laughs> but <laughs> I will say we have time probably for one question. I think it's an interesting one because I see it come up all the time around this discussion. So I feel like you'll have thoughts, which is uh, what do you think about realistic sexism and racism in games and other depictions of like, well, it's a medieval game, so we have to depict women like this and that kind of example? It's it's a decision uh, like, like any other. Um, and especially depending on the execution, I would not tell the developer to do it or not do it. 
it's it's more the 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 impact that that set of decisions has on their world and on their players. Um, am I uncomfortable with the idea of you know stepping into a fantasy world and everybody kind of seeing me as other because like I'm not an orc or something. I'm just a black dude. <laughs> that is, you know, uh, valid, but it's also like, I'll be honest, it's it's interesting. I think part of the reason we make art is to thrill, to encourage, to uh, distract and um, provide, you know, what, 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 what's, what, whatever, whatever the term is for like, there's, there's all sorts of things that games can be including quote unquote, just fun. But one of those things is like, yeah, if you want to make your players uncomfortable, if you want to say something, one, be damn sure that you're saying it well. And that's one of the reasons that we play games in the first place, to experience. Um, and I want to see more games that are approaching that intentionally um, and not being assholes about it because it's very <laughs> easy to be an asshole about it. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think intentionality is a big part of it. I feel like the where the line often is is the difference of games that I think are using historical arguments to kind of sidestep of, like you mentioned, of kind of following a chain of decisions of like, well, we didn't decide it. We we just went. That's just the way it was. Be. It's just how it was. We decided it was a medieval game. That's what had to happen. So yeah, I think owning those decisions. So. Making sure that I think Space World is the game that has taught me more so than anything to own the implications of my creative decisions. Sometimes I will, and I'm sure have been wrong. Uh, sometimes I've done something great by accident. And sometimes I've made a choice that was uncomfortable or disagreed with, but needed to be there for the work to exist or to have the impact uh, that I wanted to have. And all of those things. In all those situations, I'm learning, I have learned with this game in particular to own them. Yeah, that was me, that was our team. And the next game is going to continue that trend of intentionality and human empathy and <laughs> respect. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much for that great talk and uh, for coming to Roguelike Celebration. Take care. Remember, Roguelike Celebration, commodify your pain. Hmm. Down the years, will I regret that being taken out of context? There's only one way to find out.